Hi, my name's Megan. I'm an emergency physician with New South Wales Health and a state retrieval consultant for New South Wales Ambulance. I'm also a, one of the course coordinators in the Masters of Medicine Critical Care at Sydney Uni. Thanks for joining us today. This postgraduate degree in critical care started in 2015 after some clinicians in anesthesia, emergency medicine and intensive care recognised a need for structured education in critical care. They wanted to offer a practical, realistic and effective alternative to the current reality of hospital-based workplace education. Doctors increasingly find that once they graduate, they enter into a complex system of specialist training schemes and stressful exams. There are increasing workloads, a lack of protected teaching time, reduced education opportunities in the workplace due to your supervisors often being busy, unavailable or distracted with their own research. If you work in rural and remote locations, this can be compounded with the distance away from cutting edge critical care medicine. This degree has been structured to meet many of the critical care training requirements for the exams and the research components. It also improves your clinical knowledge as well as, as sets you up with easily accessible, high quality, interactive evidence-based education at your own pace. We want to improve your critical care knowledge, understand the evidence and be able to utilize these skills throughout your entire career. The way the course is set up allows you to curate your own education. You can enroll in just one subject per semester. One subject is called a unit of study and is worth six credit points. Completing 24 credit points gives you a graduate certificate. 36 credit points in completion is a graduate diploma. The Masters of Medicine in Critical Care requires the completion of compulsory units in epidemiology and evidence and ethics and a total of 48 credit points with an option for an advanced research. The number of courses available in these critical care degrees is extensive. There are over 20 basic and advanced units related to critical care and more available as electives. The full list is available in the online handbook. We don't believe learning in critical care should just be about reading references and writing discussion posts. We've worked really hard to make the units interactive and practical. They are based on real cases led by working critical care clinicians and continually improved with regular enthusiastic feedback from our students and graduates. The three units of study we're presenting material from today are toxicology, major trauma management, and POCUS, which is ultrasound. We're going to show you one assessment item, obviously with the student's permission, from the toxicology unit, one simulation video from the major trauma management unit, and an excerpt from the POCUS unit, which highlights our innovative learning environment. Join us after these videos for any further questions you may have. Thanks. A 41 year old male driver is involved in a car crash after an overdose of oxycodone. One of our advanced courses is toxicology. This unit introduces students to common poisonings and envenomations in Australia and provides a framework for initial resuscitation and risk assessment of the affected patient. Principles of supportive care, decontamination, enhanced elimination and specific antidotes are also explored. One of the assessments we do is drug in a hurry. His pupils are pinpoint breathing, slow responding belly. There's a toxidrome at hand, oxycodone, it must be an old narcotic widely used for stronger analgesia. There tends to be abuse on the streets for euphoria. It's an agonist that binds to the opioid receptors more strongly to the mu than the kappa or delta. It mimics the effects of endogenous opioids in the CNS to produce analgesic effects with some sedation. Pharmacokinetics start with absorption in the gut. Peak effects are at 60 minutes and persist for 3 to 6 hours. Metabolism occurs in the liver 
my CYP450 enzymes with the main inactive metabolite being noroxycodone. Excretion occurs in the urine after glucuronidation with an elimination half-life of 2 to 4 hours. Therapeutic doses of 5 to 10 milligrams every 4 to 6 hours, but be cautious and patient to it early and or have kidney or liver impaired. Now a bit on toxicology of opioid overdose. We must resuscitate and risk assess before the antidote. If the patient is not breathing and is not responding, the airway needs protecting ETT as a must. We'll send some investigations and perform supportive care. There's no real role for decontamination over here. Receptors are saturated and the body's still got free drug. It's time to bring out the antidote and finish off this rap thug. Naloxone is a pure competitive opioid receptor antagonist. Start with 100 micrograms IV and give it again every 30 to 60 seconds. Remember that resedation can occur so observe for the next two hours. Our toxicology knowledge will always be our superpower. The patient is then moved into recess, where we continue with another of our modules, trauma. This unit is designed to provide students with a solid grounding in the basic concepts of trauma resuscitation and management. It addresses numerous key aspects of trauma, including trauma systems and epidemiology. It covers the identification and management of injuries specific to each organ system and gives an overview of how to treat the sick trauma patient holistically. Here is an example of one of our trauma sims. All right, guys, um, we've got this young gentleman who's obviously a polytrauma, multiple injuries to consider. I think at this stage, we best run through our primary survey again. So in terms of our airway, can you just check that you're happy with the tube placement for me? Yep. He's got a size 8 tube at 23 centimetres. He's got a really good internal CO2 trace and good size. I'm happy that the tube is in the right place. If you're happy, I'll put him onto the ventilator. Yeah, thank you. All right, Nicole, um, I'm happy for you to move on to breathing. Okay, okay. So just checking the trachea, which is midline, looking for any subcutaneous embysema, which there's not any. I'm just having a little listen. Just give him a couple of puffs, please. So we've got equal air entry in the chest, and as you can see, he's still saturating at 100%. Okay. At this yeah. point, I'd like to just call in radiology, mm -hmm. do chest and pelvis, uh, just so that we can check the tube, but we can proceed and continue with our circulation assessment. Okay, all right. So, proofily, he's warm. Um, he's got a reasonable blood pressure of 106 on 69, and he's, his heart rate is 91 sinus. His belly is soft, but you can see his leg has been bleeding, but it looks like it's slowed down now. So there's no major hemorrhage happening, and his pelvic is still in the bind his pelvis, sorry, is still in the binder. Okay, so the leg does yeah. look quite deformed there. All right, so we're happy with all of that, and the blood products are still running. Let's move on to disability. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to check his pupils. So he's got a blown right pupil at six millimeters, and the left is two millimeters. What should we do next? Okay, so that is a bit of a cause for concern and we do need to address that. As part of the assessment, an eFAST is also completed. Another of our advanced modules is point of care ultrasound. This unit of study introduces students to ultrasound physics and nobology. Students learn how to perform scans including eFAST, AAA, vascular access, DVT, renal, hepatobiliary, basic echo, lung and early pregnancy. This unit also satisfies the coursework required for the Certificate of Clinician Performed Ultrasound, CCPU. Here is an example of an EFAST lecture on haemothorax. So how do you actually look for a haemothorax? Well, first of all, you start up high in the axilla. You can see the dark shadows from the ribs and the dirty white shadows from the lung. And then we can identify the diaphragm, the liver, the rib shadows, and we will be looking for fluid, as we've already mentioned, behind the diaphragm in this area. This is a trauma case, and we clearly have free fluid in Morrison's pouch and above the liver. A real pitfall when looking for a hemothorax is seeing something anechoic behind the diaphragm and assuming that this is blood. In the heat of the moment, especially in a multi-trauma case, it's easy to see this and diagnose a hemothorax, which may lead to an unnecessary thoracotomy. This anechoic area we're seeing here is actually an artifact. And note that the rib shadow here 
actually stops at the costophrenic angle, suggesting that there is aerated lung beyond this point and that this anechoic area is not a hemothorax. Fluid in the left upper quadrant is visible in the same way as in the right upper quadrant. To get this view, you need to identify the spleen. And then obviously this is the diaphragm here. We have the pleura here and behind the pleura, we have this dirty lung shadow. And as you can see, the anechoic area between the spleen and the dirty shadow of the lung is fluid. And again, the rib shadow continues until it reaches the lung, in which case it disappears because of the presence of air in the lung. This is a clip of a lady who fell onto her left side and suffered three broken ribs. And you can see that she's actually got fluid both above and below the diaphragm. So she's got fluid here between the spleen and the diaphragm and also fluid here between the diaphragm and the lung. The apex of the heart can be seen beating on the left, especially if you've got a very large hemothorax. And here we can see the apex of the heart just beating here. We have the anechoic hemothorax and we have the diaphragm.